True crime fans love a good case study. It is so easy to spot the flaws and mistakes from the outside and to guess what led to a terrible conclusion. But what about when you're living it? Let's say you're a single mother. You've just moved to a new apartment that's nowhere near a grocery store. It takes two buses to get to one and two buses to get back. Let's say you have $5 to your name and you need money to help your children get to their out-of-district school and to feed them and their siblings who are hungry for lunch. Your older daughters can borrow money for the bus, but how do you get them from point A to point B to retrieve it? Your little ones can't walk for miles. There's not a lot of choice here, and you let the teenagers go alone. Each generation parents radically differently from the last, and the decisions made 20 years ago seem impossible today. In 1990, childhood was essentially different. In cities, in the country, in suburbs, we walked. We were latchkey children who microwaved our own dinners. We were left alone in cars to color or read while our parents ran into the store. We played outside for hours, and our mothers simply expected we'd come home. And we did. But what if we hadn't? What if someone looked back on our childhoods and said our mothers were bad parents for giving us the freedom that nearly every other child had? What if our mothers hadn't known the full extent of what they had to fear because we didn't tell them? They'd have the rest of their lives to feel that weight. This is not just a case, and this is not just a mystery. This is a 27-year-long love story about a mother and sister who would not give up. We should treat it as such, and we should recognize the casualties. In the following interview, Shantae discusses the impact the twins' disappearance has had on her mother. How do you feel like the experience of losing her children has affected your mom? I can't even feel, imagine what she feels. Those are my sisters, and I know how I feel. And I know how I would feel if those had to be my kids. So I know how she feel, you know. I don't know physically how she feel, but I know deep down inside, she's still hurting. She hurt every every single day. When they first got missing, I used to remember time when I used to be in the living room. And she used to be in there with us, and you could see her crying. And she would go in her room, and she would start you know, close the door. And she won't come out of her room for hours and hours. She'll never let you see her look down. But I know it been eating away at her for years of what happened to her kid. And then to not get any help, because she can't go door to door knocking on people's doors saying, have y'all seen my kid? People are crazy. So for you to be in a town where the sheriff's department don't give you any kind of attention or give you any kind of help when you need it. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And they can't tell me no different that they couldn't did nothing different than back then to help her than what they did. They can't tell me that. That's, oh, I know I'm, oh, myself how I feel over the years to keep hearing Different bodies been found here. Different bodies been found there. And in the back of your mind, you wondering if that's your child that they done found. And then for them to say, oh, no. No, it wasn't none of them. Or them to announce on the news or they had Jane Doe's here or John Doe's here or whatever the case may be. You call down there to find out. They said, no. So what happened to them then? What happened? That's all we want to know. What happened? To them girls. What happened? I want to know what happened to my sister now. And I know I got kids now. They want to meet them. We want to know if they got kids, if they ever been married. But I'm quite sure if they were here, we would have known by now. Something probably tragic done happened. And over the years, you wouldn't even find no kind of evidence. You probably wouldn't even find nothing to say, well, who did what to them. Because... Y'all never gave them the proper investigation to their disappearance. The investigator just rooted as they ran away from home and he just left it as that. I just think it was bad on their part of when my sister and them originally got missing because they didn't do their job. They didn't get out here and try to help her. 
you didn't put your your anger issues or whatever the case may be to the side and do your job to look for these girls to find out what happened to them. You just put in your mind is basically what I'm saying. He put in his mind, oh, it's too long. They ain't nothing but some private kids who ran away from home. After the loss of a child, marriages are much more likely to fail. Families have higher rates of depression, suicide, and substance abuse. The American Psychological Association reports that consistent and ongoing increase in heart rate and the elevated levels of stress hormones and of blood pressure can take a toll on the body. This long-term, ongoing stress can increase the risk for hypertension, heart attack, or even stroke. Psychology Today reports that, quote, all of these issues can persist long after the child's death and may lead to a diagnosed psychiatric condition such as complicated grief disorder, which can include many symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress. These sources assume that the loss comes through the child's death and not their disappearance. So take that and, for the Sturgis family, double it. Multiply it by 27 years. For Miss Louise, monthly visits to the doctor have become weekly. In her early 60s, she can barely walk. Shantae developed high blood pressure at 39. They keep going. When Shantae and Louise chose to participate in this podcast, they did so knowing that we might bring them more pain. Not intentionally, but through what we might find. One of those findings was the woman we call the Aiken Jane Doe, who was found in January of 1993 off Highway 191 in Aiken, South Carolina. We don't have a more exact location, but we know she was found in a wooded area. Here are the other things we know. Her remains were skeletal and had been burned a significant amount of time after her death. That opens up a few possibilities. Aiken Doe might have been moved after death, moved to the forest from some other location for the purposes of a controlled burn. It might be that the Aiken Doe was there the whole time, undisturbed, until her killer came back and burned her remains. Why? It might have something to do with the advancements of DNA, though that's just a guess. We know that she had been dead for at least a few years, two to five most likely, though it could have gone a bit in either direction. She was a young woman murdered by either stabbing or gunshot. It was only in 2017 when we found the reconstruction on the Carolina missing site that Shantae saw that image again and again thought of her sisters. When she and her mother visited the Aiken County Coroner's Office, they saw that clay reconstruction in person. It was sitting on his desk. Shantae had to change seats so she wasn't facing it. It is not the end that the Sturgis family wants should it come to be true. There's no closure in the loss of a child. There's only resolution. After receiving the news that the Richmond County Sheriff would not meet with us or with the Sturgis family, we reached out in the letter we read you last week and contacted all of the officials that might have an interest in or feel a responsibility in this case. This week, Augusta Richmond County District Attorney Natalie Payne responded. She scheduled a meeting very quickly for the very next day, and one of the hosts was able to attend. Everyone else had to be at work. After another on-air interview with Jason Raven of WRDW, My co-host met with the DA and one of her investigators for over an hour. She laid out every lead that we've developed, both those that we can detail on air and those that we can't, and highlighted the mistreatment of the family and that the case was never really investigated. She mentioned NCMEC, she provided maps, and she proposed a list of actions that might be taken by Richmond County. She asked for the following. One, a meeting for the family with the sheriff's office in which they would be allowed to ask any questions about the case that they might choose. Two, DNA testing to be done in regard to the various leads and possibilities developed. Three, specific information from Nick Mech, only attainable per their policy by law enforcement regarding who closed the case and on which day. Four, a reward to be offered by the Richmond County Sheriff's Office in the case of the twins. Five, that an independent investigator be assigned to the case to explore leads and follow up with witnesses who were never questioned. D.A. Payne explained that the prosecutor's office cannot be involved in offering a reward, so there isn't any appearance that they would pay people for their testimony. She explained that Richmond County Sheriff's Office would be the agency to initiate a reward, which we knew. 
She committed to continue to communicate with Sheriff Roundtree about the case and the experience of the Sturgis family. She expressed confidence that the family will be able to have a meeting sometime in the near future with Richmond County about the case. Ms. Payne also committed to help the Sturgis family with some of the research they've tried to do. Some of the information the family has tried to get has not been available to the public, and the DA committed to help the family access that information. Finally, she indicated that her investigative staff plans to interview witnesses and relatives who were never interviewed in 1990 and who may be able to shed light on what happened all those years ago. In the following clip, my co-host discusses her experience meeting with the district attorney with a friend of the show who accompanied her on the trip. They're driving back from the meeting and recording then to keep things fresh. So keep that in mind in regards to audio quality. Mary redeemed a $50,000 cash prize playing Chumba Casino online. I was only playing for fun, so winning was a dream come true. Chumba Casino is America's favorite free online social casino. You too could have the chance to win life-changing cash prizes. Absolutely anybody could be like Mary. Be like Mary. Log on to ChumboCasino.com and play for free now. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The voice of the preceding commercial was not the actual voice of the winner. So initially, our initial meeting, I was pleased. I was nervous. As I said, I don't do this on a regular basis. Uh, she was friendly and seemed to come in ready to discuss the case immediately. So she had printed out the email packet of information that we had sent. Okay. And she immediately just began asking questions, detailed questions, about the twins' last day, their, their final walk, where they disappeared, questions about their family. And she also had some questions about the family's interactions with Richmond County. She seemed to um, give less feedback and more just asking for information, but there were times when she did appear surprised by the responses. Like when? Times when I would recount situations where they were treated, I think everyone could sort of come to the same conclusion that they were treated unfairly or dismissively by the department. For example, making calls that were never responded to both she and her investigator seemed surprised to hear some of the details about the case closure. Oh, really? Which yes. Part? The beginning, the, the initial case closure in 91, because I think we've pretty much been able to establish that not only was that not common or even ever done before, it was also sort of outrageous to imagine that children were still missing, and yet they were closing the case. What did you tell her about that, though? Just that the case was closed, and the investigator came to Louise's house the day after their incorrectly recorded 17th birthday and told her that the twins had turned 17, the case was being closed, because even if they had been found, they couldn't be made to return home at this point. But what did she say? Do you remember what she said? Much of the meeting was her absorbing information and not volunteering as much information, which was great as far as I was concerned because it was clear to me that she was very interested. She was interested in figuring out how this could have happened, how it did happen, what were the exact details. She did have a lot of questions about the twins' father, we have not been able to discuss many of these details on the podcast because right. they're not public record. We've heard quite a bit from family members about him. Because it wasn't this wasn't a recorded meeting, I was able to tell her the reports that we've received from the family members, and she seemed very interested in that. Okay. She seemed interested in, which is very typical in any abduction case, looking at people who knew the twins so not just the information that we had about the local serial killer right. or other area serial killers. She also seemed interested in friends and family members of the twins who were around on that day and in general at that time. 
which was encouraging to me because this is an issue that the family has had. They have reported that Richmond County has never interviewed any of the people who saw the twins on their final day other than the godfather. So the investigator, did the DA identify why she was there? Has she been assigned to the case? Or we don't know. She did not know. Okay. We're not sure. But she seemed to be listening very carefully. So one of the main things that came up the meeting was that Ms. Payne indicated these people were not interviewed and should have been interviewed and should be interviewed now. Oh, so are they going to do that? Yes. Oh, my God. So she collected names of family members, um, their cousin, Pumpkin. They went to her house, their sister, um, all of these individuals who saw them on their final day, in addition to people who are just cousins, family members, wow. etc. She wanted to know where they live, what streets they live on, and she indicated to me that they would like to interview these people, which is great. It seemed as though somehow her office was going to get involved in this investigation. I don't know how it works. I don't know who is in charge of it, but she had an investigator present in the meeting and she was asking for names and numbers and wanting to have these people interviewed. So it appears that she is getting involved in some capacity, which is fantastic. So the names of the people that you know that you gave her, are these people that would contact you when they are interviewed? Like, would you find out that they were interviewed or would you still not know, maybe? I think probably Shantae would find out okay. because they're in closer touch. I could contact the people and let them know that they may be contacted and ask them to get in touch with me when they are interviewed. But one of the interesting things that came from the meeting is that Ms. Payne was able to voice probably some of the concerns that Richmond County has had, which is that there's been kind of an explosion of true crime podcasts and all of them are done differently but there are some that have been very hard on law enforcement agencies. And she explained that that sometimes can make law enforcement agencies reluctant to participate with podcasts or just um, wary. I think this was in relation to me reporting that since we got involved in this case since March, both ourselves and at times the family has appeared to be treated with hostility from Richmond County. Uh, My assessment of that personally is that they recognize the investigation over the years has been just ridiculously messed up. It was mangled. It is one of the most outrageous things you can imagine. I feel like they are angry that that would happen to a family. I feel like they're angry that their department has to be associated with such a terrible injustice. Unfortunately, I feel that they are directing their anger in the wrong direction at the family, which is wildly inappropriate, especially in regards to what they have already been through. (laughs) This has already been an almost 30 year tragic injustice terrible injustice and now all over again they're met with hostility Did you when guys- really the only thing this family has ever wanted they don't have any desire to disparage anyone they want to find their children so Ms. Payne was able to shed some light on where some of that hostility may be coming from and that it is probably not directed at the family but probably has a lot more to do with the fact that we are creating a podcast about their agency. I guess, you know, as long as they start helping at some point, then, you know, you look past that. But short of that, what am I supposed to to think? That was my thought. It seemed like this was such a great opportunity for a department that has been maligned, accused of racial injustice, 
what a beautiful opportunity. Right. They so swoop in. They say, we're helping this family. They go above and beyond. They do this investigation. They help the family. And everyone can recognize them as heroes, people who care about the community. And I was completely stunned that that didn't happen. And in fact, the opposite kind of happened, which was surprising in my mind. Did you guys talk at all about the original investigator? Did he come up Yes, we did. I believe I did mention our phone conversation. This was in regards to, again, Ms. Payne needed to express again that she does not want to give the family any false hope. She wants to help the family not hurt them by giving them all of this false hope and not being able to deliver. And my response to that was, We recognize, I recognize certainly, that some cases will never be solved. I think the family will be able to tolerate that reality as long as they feel that this case has been investigated. And at this point, it has not. And I believe that was when I recounted the phone conversation that I had with the original investigator where I asked him directly, Has there ever been a time when this case was treated as anything other than just two runaways? And his response was no. So here we are. This looks like movement. But the Sturgis family has felt hope before. In 2013, when the case was reopened, when officials made statements as to what might be done, and nothing happened then. But maybe things are different now that the full extent of the damage is being shown. Only time will tell. And we'll make it clear to Richmond County and to any and every agency that we will not stop. Next time, closure. This episode stands as the last regular episode of the season, the who knows. Things are finally moving and the fall line will continue to report on the Millbrook case. As always, stay informed, share the story, and most of all, get involved. You're making it happen. You're coming in hot. Hotter than hot. Hotter than the surface of the sun. Even hotter than the metal part of your seatbelt. Put it on ice with Dunkin' Iced. Like the new brown sugar cream cold brew or the new mango pineapple Dunkin' Refreshers. (sighs) America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. Oh, we could, we could fly. This is your summer. That means Six Flags in the taste of an ice-cold Coca-Cola. We're talking thrilling coasters, delicious burgers, yes. real moments together, and this. <sighs> Coke is summer refreshment when you need it most, so you can hop on another ride. This is your summer. Six Flags and Coca-Cola. Come make it yours. Visit SixFlags.com slash Coke to save up to $20 off passes, plus daily tickets starting at $44.99. Yeah.